All right. With that said, uh, Mr. Dave Ingram, could you uh, would you please to in, uh, introduce our special guest speaker? Yeah, I sure will. Uh, Keith Crum is one of those easy people to introduce. He's involved in uh, amateur astronomy at all levels. You know, he's self educated and uh, put himself through college uh, at an old old age of a uh, probably what 45 or 50 Keith is that about right <laughs> uh, yeah self- actually I took some classes uh, from UW uh, just a few years ago got a UW degree maybe not a degree but some classes at the UW and those <laughs> are available amazing. to all of us uh, as senior citizens so take advantage of the Uni- University of Washington Astronomy Department. But anyway, Keith's involved in uh, uh, outreach. Uh, outreach and education is part of the charter of the uh, Seattle Astronomical Society. Uh, you can certainly educate yourself uh, by joining and uh, participating. But the other thing that we really uh, press on is getting out there and providing outreach to the general public. We believe it's very important that um, good scientific information, uh, valid, timely, and accurate uh, be provided to the general public. And um, I know that sometimes we get caught up, uh, but uh, NASA Solar System ambassadors are involved in giving us timely, uh, accurate information on a regular basis. There's about 15 of them in the Puget Sound area, and I think there are six of them that are actually members of the uh, Seattle Astronomical Society. And Keith is one of the more active ones, and we really appreciate what he does at the Pacific Science Center, and he recently spoke at the Theodore Jacobson, and he's also active in his own community. He goes overseas as well um, to share the message of uh, astronomy education and outreach. So without a further ado, I'll pass it over to Keith. Thanks, Dave. Very good. Appreciate that. Uh, Yeah, I was here. Oh, I don't know, what was it, Aaron, a few months ago, I guess, talking about uh, doing outreach in Kenya, which was uh, quite an experience. I'm still uh, still processing it a bit, honestly, after all this time. Anyway, tonight uh, we want to talk about Titan and the potential for life in the deep subsurface of Titan. Um, I became interested in Titan a few uh, years ago when I read a book uh, about potential life there and potentially living there. And I'll talk about that at the end of this uh, talk. But um, I think it's really one of the most fascinating places, if not the most fascinating place in the solar system right now. We hear a lot about Mars, of course, and other things. But Titan is just uh, really intriguing. And uh, on the day that Aaron, about 10 days ago, that Aaron asked me to uh, talk tonight, I, I went to a talk from a professor at JPL, and he uh, was doing this uh, talk on uh, deep uh, life in in the ice on Titan. So uh, it was perfect timing. Um, It's a lot to digest, and I'm still digesting it. So if you see me looking down at my speaker notes, I just want to make sure I don't miss anything uh, really important as we go through it. Uh, That said... I'm going to share one solar system ambassador thing that is related, uh, but I like to pass this along. So I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with NASA eyes on the solar system. Uh, This is really an amazing tool. I'm just zooming in and out with my keyboard here. But you can go to any one of these uh, this is the OSIRIS-REx mission to the asteroid Bennu that is now on its way back. You can look at all the Mars missions. You can go to Earth and look at all the missions going around Earth. Um, tonight our uh, talk is about Titan and uh, Saturn. So there we have the moon system around Saturn. It doesn't have the Cassini mission in here anymore. It only has active missions but it does have all of the, uh, it does have all the real time placement of uh, NASA missions uh, in this tool. So there you can just fly around like that, zoom in and out, learn a lot. The other thing, it does have some of the other missions that um, are not going on like uh, Cassini. 
sorry, it just takes a second to load, I guess. But because um, the Cassini is one really interesting because it, it shows you a lot about Cassini and about Huygens, uh, the lander. Um, and uh, it, you can run this time sequence back and forth and see uh, the whole mission from beginning to end. So anyway, I just thought I'd put that plug in for, uh, for, uh, for NASA eyes on the solar system. There we have the moons uh, and there's Titan. So there's the nitrogen, methane, hazy sky we'll talk about, and then different ways of looking at it. That we'll, and you can move around and look at it and all that good stuff. Okay. So eyes on the solar system. Oh, yeah, by the way, it's your tax dollars at work. So it's uh, free. Uh, you can download the app or you can just run it off of, uh, run it, run it off of uh, a, a website. You do have to have uh, Internet access for it. Okay, so pulling up the presentation here, okay. So potential for deep life and subsurface of Saturn's moon Titan. Um, like I said, a fascinating place, Titan. I'm more and more interested in it all the time. Um, I, uh, especially after Dr. Malaska's uh, talk the other day and um, uh, this is my background I think Dave Ingram covered most of this already uh, that tool NASA eyes on the solar system was the main tool I used at Pacific Science Center the interesting thing about that was uh, usually the kids were gone in about two and a half minutes and it was their parents that stayed there with me for half an hour so <laughs> that was uh, really fun Use that tool down there. Goldendale Sky Village, Star Trek Academy, we're doing some uh, mountaineer classes there. And I also have been involved with the Climate Reality, Reality Project. So I, I always like to start with NASA's three big questions. How does the universe work? How did we get here? And are we alone? So we'll talk a little bit on one aspect of all three of those questions here tonight. Uh, before I get into Dr. Malaska's uh, detailed slides, uh, he did not provide much background on Titan itself, and so I decided to add to it the top 20 uh, facts. Uh, Aaron and I talked about having cool pictures of Titan and Saturn, so I have 10 slides here with 20 facts about Titan. So just starting here at 20, uh, Saturn is about 9.6 AU from the sun, and its light time to Earth is an hour and 17 minutes and a little bit more. And um, that becomes important when we talk about the Dragonfly uh, copter, quadcopter uh, that's uh, going to be landing there hopefully in the next uh, 10 or 12 years uh, because it will have to be pretty much fully autonomous uh, with that amount of time between uh, Earth and Titan. Uh, Titan is 750,000, 759,000 miles from Saturn, it's ways out there. Uh, it's drifting away as our Earth moon is drifting away, uh, four inches per year for Titan. A couple of images here of the hazy uh, atmosphere again. It is the largest of Saturn's moons. It is the second largest uh, natural satellite in the solar system. Uh, it was once thought to be the largest moon for a long time until Voyager came along. So um, now, uh, now it's second largest and it has very, this atmosphere we're talking about is 370 miles thick. Here's an infrared uh, picture of it. Uh, it's dense nitrogen atmosphere. It's about one and a half times Earth. Um, and that's, overall and in general one and a half times earth it's actually about four times uh that at the surface four times earth so it's pretty thick nitrogen with uh, five percent methane and these are one of seven gravitationally rounded moons of saturn i don't think i have to tell this group that the way something gets round is it's big enough to have its gravity make it round so uh in the saturn system 
this is one of the seven rounded moons. There are a whole bunch more, which we'll show a graphic up here in a second. Size comparison, so um, larger than the moon, 14% uh, gravity, a um, little bit less gravity than the moon, and uh, it's larger than Mercury. Its orbital period is 15 days, 22 hours, and it is tidally locked. Again, probably don't have to tell this group, tidally locked means the same face is toward the planet all the time. Lakes of methane, it's very cold there, so methane is a liquid, like the water I need to drink. If we were on Titan, the sun would be a bright spot overhead about one-tenth the size of our sun. And the amount of daylight there, this, is, this picture is showing a lot more daylight. Um, this is a, a Cassini Huygens picture um, uh, that's been enhanced a bit because actual sunlight would be about 10 minutes after sunset on Earth. So be kind of twilight at midday. So, again, oxygen and methane would be liquid at these temperatures. The game changer here and what they really discovered uh, with Cassini, one of the big things is uh, that um, this, uh, that, that th this is rich in organic molecules. And uh, thank you. I got some more fresh water. Thank you. Uh, and... Uh, that means a lot. There's a lot happening uh, on Titan with organic molecules, and that's what we're going to dive into as we get through these top 20. So, um, again, organic molecules in this haze, a lot going on here, and it has a greenhouse effect uh, similar to Earth because of the methane, but it is less than Earth, so it doesn't get very warm there. Um, polar clouds are methane. Uh, compared to our polar clouds of water ice. Similar idea. A lot of similarities with the Earth, other than the oxygen part. Um, the Pioneer mission was in 79, and the Voyager mission was in 80. And number two, of course, was the wonderful, marvelous, incredible Cassini-Huygens mission that uh, brought back a lot of data that they're still digesting. And Dr. Malaska is still using this data and probably will for years to come uh, to talk about what's happening on Titan uh, and Saturn, of course, but particularly Titan and his uh, studies. And upcoming, I think maybe most people have heard about the Dragonfly mission. We'll talk about that at the end. Um, it is a quadcopter, like I said, and uh, so we'll see some more information about that a little later. There's a, I think, pretty famous picture most people have probably seen of the Huygens of the surface. Uh, one thing I learned that I didn't know about this picture was that those rocks are not very big. They're only about 15 centimeters across. So these are not big boulders that are showing there. Small, rocky, ice clusters. This was kind of an otherworldly picture from Huygens that I just liked, so I threw it in. Um, this is a picture that was taken on EDL entry, descent, and landing um, back in 2005. So just to wrap it up, uh, lots of moons. You can see these to scale here, uh, Titan being the big hazy one there. And this is the whole Titan system, all these named moons out here way away from there, including Titan out further where the missions pass through, and uh, yeah, that's good. Okay, so the number one question we want to ask is, are we alone? So nitrogen, methane, organic molecules, all the fixins for life we seem to find on Titan, and so can we find it? How do we find it? How did it get there? Are we alone, et cetera? So, and is colonizing possible? Uh, I'll talk about a book that I read on that subject, which was, I highly recommend, easy read. We'll get that at the end. Again, Michael Malaska is from uh, JPL, 
and he's the impre principal investigator on NAI, and NAI is NASA Astrobiology Institute. And uh, he was also, he, he was a really interesting guy. He, he um, was in pharmaceuticals as an organic chemist, and the Cassini mission turned him on to NASA and JPL, and he decided to go to JPL and be an organic chemist there. And now he's the principal investigator. So he started his whole different career out of pharmaceuticals and into space science uh, just in the last 15 years or so. Okay, so jumping right into it. Life in the ice. The game changer here is that we have found life in ice on Earth in the Arctic uh, in very high pressures, very cold temperatures, minus 15 degrees centigrade there. Very tiny, 100 micron picture there going down. If you blow it up to the upper right-hand corner, a 10 micron picture, adding a little fluorescent stain, you find these microbes living in the ice. This is a triangular area of ice crystal that comes together that leaves a little pocket right here. And life gets trapped in there as ice forms. So that's kind of what we know from what we see in the Arctic. So the question is, where else? Where else? So lots of worlds are supported by ice. And I'm going to take just a second and look at my notes and make sure that I am on track. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, um, you know, all these worlds they have a certain amount of uh, water on them. Uh, these, these are from left to right. I want to get these right. So the moon, ice at the poles. Io has no water ice, unfortunately. Europa. Ganymede, Callisto, Titan, and Triton. Uh, of the last four, these four of these are considered ocean worlds, as well as Triton out here, all the way out here. Uh, these, ha these might have the chemical building blocks uh, for life. And uh, as we know, Earth life inhabits deep warm ice and ocean environments and deep warm ice and ocean are common across the solar system. So lots of worlds have lots of water and potential for life. When we talk about lots of water, uh, this is a graphic I had not seen until Dr. Malaska's uh, talk the other day. Uh, I never, you know, I always think about Earth as being in a water planet, but compared to these other objects here, um, it really has a lot less. There's a lot of covering, covering at the surface, but it's not as deep uh, as many of the other worlds shown here. So you see Earth has that amount of water compared to its size. Europa, Pluto, Triton, Callisto, Titan, and Ganymede. So many have ice crusts with deep subsurface oceans like Titan. A little bit more of comparison. So we got a lot of nitrogen here, 78%. Titan has 95%. One versus one and a half that we always already talked about. Very cold on uh, Titan. Earth at about 57 degrees uh, Fahrenheit there, 298 Kelvin. Lots of uh, liquid cycle here that is water, water liquid cycle. On Titan, the water cycle is uh, methane, CH4. And we have a lot of rock. And Titan has, I almost said they have. Titan has a, a, a lot of organics uh, everywhere, subsurface, surface, in the atmosphere, and uh, has a lot of water ice below the surface. Okay. All right. So the uh, NASA Astrobiology Institute, their goal is to follow the organics. So because Cassini brought back a lot of information, a lot of data, 
we can draw this picture of what's going on in Titan. So we've got, uh, we've got surface sediments here. We've got atmospheric fallout of organic materials. And there's some science-related pictures of organic materials. Potential life down in the global water ocean. Inorganic ions. Uh, we have delivered organics, things that have come out of the atmosphere and down into the ocean and the uh, crust. Volatile methane and potential chemical bio biosignatures, biosignature produced down here. So follow the organics. So that's, uh, that's the picture they're now drawing of uh, what's happening on Titan. And we'll get into a little bit different versions of this as we go through this. So if we go back maybe a few billion years, we know Titan formed from comet and meteoric uh, uh, stuff that came together. And uh, there was some uh, heating as it came together from the core and organics were heated from that core. And so we had some conversion of CO2 to methane. So um, as time went by, that stuff started percolating up. And now we have this methane in the, in the nitrogen sky. And um, uh, the result was a lot of organics. So through this billion year or more uh, cycle of development, that's how we got to uh, uh, carbon dioxide and methane. A lot going on in the organic haze. Uh, it's uh, got a lot of different ingredients in it, and I'll talk about those in just a second. Um, oops, sorry. And uh, these have different uh, processes, uh, different temperatures, different pressures. They this chemistry, as Dr. Malaska says, is incredibly beautifully complex. And then he showed us this picture. <laughs> so I love this picture. Uh, I'm not an organic chemist. Uh, I kind of get what some of these C's and H's mean uh, and what the, uh, what the connections are between them. This is actually a simple picture of what's going on. More recent models, as it says here, have over 400 equations. He did not go through this chart. But he, he did bring it back to a little simpler uh, discussion. Um, using spectrography, uh, they've, uh, they've found this particular element there, cyclopropylidine. Um, it is uh, not very stable but it has been detected on Titan, along with many others, all these enes and anes here that you see. And so that becomes important because you can see how these things move around in the atmosphere. So this is the Alma Doppler. Alma is from the uh, uh, Akamana uh, large millimeter uh, array down in Chile, and they can actually trace these molecules at different altitudes. So you can see the CH3CN uh, and where it is in the atmosphere at different heights. Uh, same for this one and same for this one. So they can actually detect these using Doppler and ELMA, and that can tell you what's going on in the atmosphere and how things are moving around. Now, the important part about that is it, you know, there's a lot of interface with what's going on on the surface. Just like here, we have winds that blow stuff around on the surface. And that's what they're trying to map here is the winds that are blowing around on Titan. And what does that mean for organic chemicals on Titan? And again, these are some models that uh, look a lot of, at these lot of these organic uh, 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 chemicals, where they are in the altitude and how they're reacting. Some of these are models and some of these are actual data. So they're trying to uh, line up the models with the actual data and just to keep tweaking the models uh, so they can know how things are moving around. Okay, so now 
bringing all that down to the surface, we can uh, start talking about what is in. I'm going to move you all out of the way here so I can see the key. Huh. There we go. So most of the surface of Titan are, are the lake and basin areas, this gray, or the plains, excuse me, the gray area are the plains. Uh, the lake and basins area up here, the lakes of methane are, at, are near the poles, as seen on the right here at the pole. Uh, there are lots of dunes in orange. These are craters from impact, and they're really important. And we'll talk about why in a second. But when we talk about organic molecules moving around, um, you really want to think about these craters and what happens when something hits the planet and what that does to uh, moving material. Down here at the labyrinths, at the south part of the, uh, at the South Pole, are uh, very thick, 500 meter thick organic materials, and there's some charts on that coming up. Whoop, what was that? Yeah, thick organic and lubricants. Okay, good. Covered that. And that's what this is all about. So uh, this chart shows a picture of the thick organics at the southern poles, um, over 500 meters thick. And uh, they're in plains and dunes. So this is really important to uh, understanding how much organic material is actually on, on the planet. Huge amount. It's an it's a organic synthesis factory. And it's been working for a long time, millions of years. Um, when we talk about things moving around, so big storms move organic materials just like here. So this... Uh, chart is subtle, but this is actual data that shows how um, sediments have been transported uh, and dissolution explains some of the landscape as time has gone by. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I don't really know that how much time lapse this is, but um, what's important is that things do move. It's a very active planet, planet, Ooh, very active moon. So we've got stuff going on, atmospheric uh, photochemistry. Uh, it, it creates uh, organic molecules, which fall as a rain onto the surface. That rain then can go down into, uh, transport down into subsurface lakes, and then can transport across plains. These would be like the, uh, the labyrinthian uh, areas, uh, lots of organics forming in that area. They could go into basins. They could come back up and go back down into basins and plateaus. And so all of this stuff, again, is going on on Titan. A, a, once again, very active place. Um, so when it comes to impacts, this, this chart didn't really talk about impacts so much, but um, Impacts are very important. So, um, you know, an initial melt can happen from something big hitting the planet, uh, the moon. Uh, and then it takes quite a bit of time, up to 10,000 years, uh, by our standards, quite a bit of time, uh, for it to spread down uh, further into the surface. So um, this, this is kind of a graphic that it tells you where these melt pools end up, descends, goes into melt pools, and then spreads at the base. So these are the models that they're using to show how the organics come out of the sky, onto the ground, and into the deep subsurface. And to kind of summarize that, so we've got the uh, ox uh, organic-rich atmosphere and organic-rich surface. There's a decoupled outer shell of water ice and clathrate here in this area. Global subsurface ocean, very huge amount of water as we showed in one of the earlier charts. Then this high pressure shell and a silicate core. So that today, based on that baby right there, Cassini, told us that this is the current view of the 
ice crust, the deep ocean, the high pressure bottom, and the ocean 10 times deeper than Earth's ocean. So deep ice microenvironments, getting back to that where we kind of started, no sunlight, very high pressure, very low temperature, uh, physical microenvironments, chemical concentrations. So this is how ice forms up um, and uh, crystallizes and leaves little pockets. And in these little pockets, again, this is the triangle where things come together in the crystals. And what we see is dividing bacterium here in this little uh, 10 uh, micron uh, square here between the ice grains. Another graphic of how this happens. So it works through uh, crystallizing. Material gets entombed in these areas between the crystals. Uh, water freezes out, uh, jacks concentration. So uh, chemistry happens, that's the question mark. So that's the question mark. You know, is chemistry happening here to have a life in these deep environments on Titan? Uh, convective transport that we talked about, and then a wonderful mixing during convection. Uh, here's a scale chart. Okay, so you got eight microns versus, uh, what was it down here? Sorry, color up again. 0. 0.2 microns. So uh, these are very, very tiny possible cells of life. And just a, a gallery of things that might be there. These are all different kinds of uh, micro, uh, microbes. Um, and this was uh, from Greenland ice. Uh, here's another view. Now we talk a little bit about pressure. So on Earth, we get pressures uh, at this kind of depth in kilometers and pressures uh, that look like that on Titan. It's a little different. Uh, the pressures are much lower. Of course, it's, you know, one-seventh the gravity there. So pressures are going to be different because it's a, a different uh, uh, body. But pressure is important because that helps uh, figure out how the ice forms up and where it forms up and is it possible to have life at these depths. Uh, so uh, the two things uh, to find biosignatures from the ocean to the surface, where and how, the two main things are volcanoes, or cryovolcanoes, and that, that one is Doom Mons, and uh, we'll show that in a minute, and then impacts, the Minerva impact crater. So um, this is just another graphic of showing the stuff moving around. So this is the cryovolcano, uh, the Doom Mons. And you can see it looks very similar to a uh, volcano in Iceland. And so we're, the thought here is that something big hit this, or, or excuse me, this is, uh, this is the volcano. This uh, exploded with uh, liquids, and, um, and then out came organic materials onto the surface. So that's kind of what they're uh, uh, hypothesizing here, similar to what happens here. And this is a graphic of the 20, uh, 60, sorry, uh, 6,100 seconds uh, that it takes for stuff to move around. And this is, well, this is a graphic of that. Uh, that's what happens in the 6,100 seconds. Uh, throwing stuff up, as you can see, from very deep down. Uh, up onto the surface. So that's a, a model that they're working with now to get a good handle on how things move. So kind of a similar thing with organics here in these deep warm ice areas, uh, deep subsurface oceans, possible organics, possible uh, uh, microbes here. And what can we do to find some? So one idea is a probe, and they're talking about that. They're making some preliminary designs for, for that. Um, this would show a cryovolcano, and then other things that could land there and test uh, stuff that's come up to the surface. And so looking at Titan again, here's uh, the um, radio labyrinths where there could be material. 
This is where the Minerva is. This is where the other uh, area is, the sort of ones. These are more labyrinths down here. So uh, the dragonfly target is there, which looks a little odd since it's not there or there or there or there. But uh, it is a quadcopter. So the idea is, uh, you know, maybe land there and then figure out where to go. So how do we look for life on Titan? Look for things we don't expect based on chemistry. And Dr. Malaska says weird stuff is interesting. So here's a picture of a dragonfly. Uh, it's about the size of Perseverance. Um, we've, of course, everybody knows we've had success with ingenuity. Ingenuity has, uh, you know, I don't know, 25, 26, 27 flights now. Amazing. It's gone on and on. Uh, this is a radioisotope uh, battery generated, so it could basically last for a very long time and um, doesn't rely on sunlight. And um, yeah, so it's going to launch in 27 and hopefully arrive in 34. So I look forward to that. This is the entry, descent, and landing, or EDL. And I have a really nice video here of the EDL. So here we go. It's a, similar, I think, to most of uh, the EDLs we've seen with uh, Perseverance coming down in a back shell. But then no parachutes. It just flies away, which is really cool. Big quadcopter. And it can look around. Of course, now being an hour plus, hour and 15 minutes away, uh, light time, it's going to be on its own. Well, we'll just be waiting for stuff to come back. And it won't have much of a chance to uh, change things very often. And then it can take off and fly again. So that's the concept for and where they're headed with it. So just to sum up, key takeaways. Second largest ocean in the solar system. Very rich in organics. Habitable conditions likely in subsurface Titan. Um, oceans are the best place to look for life in the solar system. And then he thought, and their current team thinks the Minerva Crater Ejecta is, the, is a good place to go for, uh, for Dragonfly to go particularly. I always like to kind of end with what I've been reading. So the book I talked about that I read a few years ago that uh, was part of a solar system ambassador talk was this uh, book called Beyond Earth. Our path, uh, this was to Titan right here, our path to the new home in the planets. Uh, really an easy, good read. Uh, this book, uh, I have to say that if you haven't been in love with the Earth, this book, will make you be forever in love with the earth. It is a, uh, an amazing book. It is, it is like a textbook. It's like 900 pages. You don't have to read the whole thing, but uh, it is absolutely a fantastic book and really makes you appreciate how to build a habitable planet. Just amazing. Highly recommend it. Um, this book talks about a lot of other things that are, uh, conjecture, very interesting. So one of the things is you could walk around on Titan without a spacesuit. You'd have to have very warm clothing because it's very cold uh, and just a mask. Uh, and because at the surface it's four times Earth's atmosphere, uh, you could actually fly with wings. So um, that they talk about that in this book. That's just a little hors d'oeuvre for anyone interested in reading more details about some of the possibilities of tonight. So with that, Aaron, my friend, I will stop sharing unless maybe we want to go back to some charts. I don't know. You are muted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. You did a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I learned a lot. So I love doing these things because I learn a ton. And it was just amazing that 
uh, on the day that Aaron said, let's talk about Titan, I was going to this talk from Dr. Malaska. So it was the very same day. <laughs> so I've spent the last 10 days uh, doing the best I can to understand all this stuff. All right. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, no, thank you so much, Keith. Uh, you, I hope you saw my emoji of standing ovation. Um, <laughs> I, I'll give you a real clap at home, here at home, uh, in yeah, real yeah, life. So, yeah. yeah. Appreciate thank it. you. No. How exciting. No, I love the the depth of um, the journey of the presentation from, like, even the excitement of what Titan is, if you haven't uh, heard of it before, and to the, the similarities and the potential. Uh, you know, I've even seen some videos, um, you know, where like maybe in a few hundred million years, you know, maybe humans can be there. Who knows uh, when things start to melt on Titan? Who knows? But um, yeah, I, I love the idea of um, not to uh, I'll buy people some time for questions. We have some in the chat. Uh, Keith, you can um, feel free to take whatever questions you want. I always answer. say I answer every question, even if the answer is I don't know. I love that. I love that. Um, <laughs> And, uh, but yeah, I think that, uh, I love the idea of, I saw images from the, the Cassini and Huygens probe of like, um, of just the lake shores, if you want to call it that. And just, I love the idea that there's a place out there right now where there's like a beach, you know, they do have beach, you know, and, uh, and, um, that, you know, it, one day maybe, maybe we'll be able to, to sit on that beach. Uh, yeah. Maybe. I mean, we're from Seattle. Like, I mean, we're, we're conditioned for that kind of beach. Yeah, like two hundred. Yeah, even though so, it'll be daylight, will be like twilight. But uh, yeah. but uh, that's okay, you know. Uh, twilight's nice, you know. I it would be fascinating. Yeah, I, I I totally agree. And also, what you said about billions of years from now, you know, as the sun gets bigger, it's going to cool down. It might be a really nice place to be. Yeah. So, it's going to heat up. I mean, not cool down. It'll heat up, but Titan will heat up, and who knows what can happen. All right. And then so, uh, yeah, no, we'll take about 15 minutes of questions and eight about uh, end at about 8.30. Uh, Keith, uh, you have a couple in the chat there. Um, I have one from Anthony uh, Vecio. Um, uh, will Firefly collect and test samples in ocean? So that's a popular question that's actually uh, a question that i had as well too and i was curious about that yeah dragonfly so i i'm sure they will go to the lakes so you know they call them the lakes that were up north there on the chart uh i i would i don't think they've exactly figured out where all they want to go yet dr malaska wanted to go to the minerva uh impact crater uh because they're really looking for i you know looking for signs of life in that area what's percolated up from uh, the uh, deep ocean area um, you know, the methane lakes, uh, I, I think that's to be determined. Uh, they're not exactly in the same area on Titan as, as Minerva. So I think they have a lot of work to do yet uh, between now and 2034 to figure out exactly where they want to go with this thing. But with that thing, the way it's made with the radioisotope battery, it could probably be there going around that place for a long time. Wonderful. Does that answer? That, that's, that's all I know about it. I don't think anybody really knows exactly uh, where they're going to go. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, Anthony agrees. Um, Third Rock Astronomy, I, lo uh, I love our new friends at Third Rock Astronomy. Uh, have they detected any phosphate on Titan? Phosphine, sorry. Phosphine. Uh, that was not in the uh, chemicals that I saw in the graphics. Um, any organic chemists in the group here? I'll flip back to that chart that shows. Uh, I don't recall phosphines. Where is that sucker? Uh, I don't know if you pick phosphine out of this list um, or out of that one. I don't – it was not listed in, in any of these. So um, these are the ones he mentioned and that he talked about, and I don't know more than what's uh, in this presentation. So, Well, they really uh, – the spelling of those, they all look like the same <laughs> – 
thing to me. But uh, yeah, I thought I saw. Yeah. It. I said, well, they get these organic chemi, you yeah. know, organic chemistries, the enes and the anes, and yeah. You pH know. three. Nice. So sorry, I I can look that one up, but I don't know that I uh, he didn't discuss phosphine. Yeah, and I was, uh, no, that's that's great. Um, I, I think that, uh, yeah, I'm really excited to see what uh, Dragonfly uh, finds when it gets over there. Um, uh, I'm really curious about the automated uh, portion of the mission itself. itself. I, I'm, yeah. I'm assuming they're learning a lot from uh, Mars Perseverance. And, yeah, and, uh, for sure they are. And, you know, it, like you say, it does have to be pretty much autonomous with since it's so dang far away. Um, you know, they'll, they'll tweak, obviously, where it's going. It'll go somewhere, and then they'll wait, and then they'll send it new uh, instructions. But uh, I can't imagine what it's like to have the patience of those people, even working on Mars, where you have to wait for, what, 15 minutes or something. Yeah, and feel free to uh, ask any more questions in the chat, or uh, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, ask a question as well. We have about 12 minutes here. Um, no, I, I just love talking about Titan. So if you can sit here for 10 minutes talk about Titan, uh, I, I'm in. You know, uh, Steve, you got something? Yeah, the phosphorus is part of phosphine, and there, there are no phosphorus in any of those yeah. chemicals. Good point. Thank you. Makes sense. Ooh. Uh, Keith, you got a question about from uh, Becky and Arnold about the battery? What's yes. The, what, what's what? What's the battery made from again, and life expectancy, and and such? Well, they last a long time. The radioisotope batteries. So this is uh, radioisotope uh, creates heat, which creates electricity. So it's a it's a nuclear reaction essentially. And uh, there may be people in the audience that know more about uh, radioisotope uh, batteries than I do, but. Uh, you know, we've used them with other spacecraft. We use them today in spacecraft. Um, they are uh, they are very long lasting because that radioactive material can generate heat for a very long time. I think Voyager doesn't Voyager use radioactive? But they must. I mean, that's the only Voyager still out there, right? All these years later, uh, sending signals back. So. The only way it can do that would be to have a long-lasting battery. Is that answer? Is that is that poking at the question? Um, I did have a graphic in here on the bat. It was very detailed. I decided to take it out because I thought it was kind of off subject. But uh, you know, there's some really good information out there about radioactive batteries, and they're very complicated, complex uh, tools. Um, yeah, and Keith, do you have access to the chat, by the way? Uh, yeah, we have, we have some um, I can open up the chat. I yeah, do. yeah, yeah. There's a lot of activity. Everybody's really excited about that. And um, yeah, feel free to check that out. Uh, you know what? Uh, well, yeah, no real reaction, just using radioactive decay of the material. Uh, that's my understanding, yes. I agree with that. Uh, what is the radioisotope? What's the half-life? Uh, those are really good questions. I'm sorry, I don't have the, yeah. RTG is correct. Yep, that's all about the battery. Yep, okay, got it. So, uh, Keith, and I was I wanted to clarify because like I when I think of Titan and walk, imagining myself walking around on it, and um, I think of the surface as like, you know, in Earth we have rock, obviously, but in Titan. Um, uh, what is the surface material again? And like, if the temperatures do heat up as the sun uh, in a couple hundred million years, it, I would think uh, when the sun uh, expands and Titan heats up potentially, um, will the like what will be melting? We know something will be melting, right? So, uh, yeah. Well, there is uh, there is water ice there. Um, there was a quote from this book that I was going to read that um, pokes at that, exactly what you're talking about. And I just need to get to it on my other uh, computer here real quick. Um, it says from the book, 
again, as a little hors d'oeuvre, Titan is a place where human beings could survive without base uh, spacesuits, walking around in warm clothing and oxygen masks, and could live in non-pressurized buildings. It's not that hard to imagine standing on Titan's strange orange landscape on damp, soft ground, such as the Hogan probe encountered. So it was damp, soft ground right now. So what could happen to that as it warms? That's a really interesting question. If it's damp and soft now, is it going to be like mud or what does it turn into? And I don't think anyone's conjectured on that as far as I know, Aaron. That, so mm -hmm. it has no, pebbles of hard, it does have pebbles of hard ice. So you imagine as it warms up, of course it'd have to get up to some temperature. I don't know what it would be on Titan, but, uh, some uh, temperature where that those ice pellets would melt. No, that was a beautiful answer, uh, Keith. That's uh, yeah, very poetic. That book. Um, yeah, yeah, it's really I like good the description. Book. Yeah, yeah, you, and, you'd uh, like it, Aaron. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll have to add that to the list real quick. Um, my list of books purchasing is outpacing my Brooks read. So, but we'll we'll, we'll work on that. Um, yeah, Avery, uh, we have some more comments here, Keith. Christian uh, Huygens. Yeah. Oh, somebody uh, says RTG's plutonium-238, half-life 90 years. Okay, good, good, 238. I think I did know that, but I didn't remember the number. Thank you. Thank you, Isuki. And, and Avery Morton? Yeah, so Christian Huygens, 1655, discovered Titan. It was the, let's say, one, two, three, four, five, sixth moon to be discovered. Our moon, of course four moons of Jupiter, and then the next one, Christian Huygens uh, discovered, was Titan. So, uh, and more info I, on Christian Huygens. That's about what I know. I'm sure there's a lot more to know about Christian Huygens, but uh, off the top of my head, that's what I know. Claim to fame. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, Keith, I don't know if you saw in the chat. Uh, Avery Morton asked, uh, how do you think Saturn's radioactivity could impact life? In Titan's subsurface. That's a very interesting question. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking uh, maybe. Yeah, yeah, that's that's well, great. The way the way uh, the way it impacts it at the subsurface is kind of what I talked about. So a lot of that activity that's taking place in the atmosphere is because of what's happening not only from solar uh, ultraviolet radiation, but also from radiation from 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 Saturn. So that's making a lot of stuff happen in the atmosphere, in that very 370-mile-thick atmosphere. Uh, and then that's going down into the, down to the surface and then down below the surface. So it's kind of indirectly affecting it, but um, th that is what's happening there now in terms of how uh, Saturn churns up the atmosphere. I don't know that it, they know very much about radiation affecting the directly infecting subsurface uh there's a lot to get through to get down to subsurface so good question yeah great question yeah it's it's i'm always curious when we talk about moons or mars i mean and the search for life um you know it's uh i'm curious to know which one of these moons and or mars is going to come up with something tantalizing first you know um and uh, uh, maybe we'll have to talk about the clip. Uh, is the Europa Clipper uh, sometime? Europa. Yeah, yeah. Keith, please That's come back Europa. for please come back yeah. for Europa Clipper talk. That's Europa right. Clipper. Yeah. I have to study up on that. <laughs> yeah. When is when is the Clipper launching? That has an official date yet. I think they have a projected date, but I don't recall it off the top of my head. Okay, so if we have a serious questions in the chat as well too. Another Avery Morton questions, Keith. Uh, it's a difficult one. So we don't uh, know if we have, uh, sorry, it jumped around, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles yet. No, we don't know. We don't know. Okay. But, you know, what I found so fascinating about Malaska's talk was he really laid out, and I did the best I could echoing his message, that all the stuff is there, and we know it. We know it's here. We know there are microbes here. So in deep ice, under a lot of pressure, in very cold environments, you know, in these little tiny pockets. So 
I think it was super exciting, you know. No, we don't know that there are any mutant ninja turtles yet, but um, we do know that it's possible because all the right stuff is there. Uh, just Should I just read down them here, Aaron? So the power supply starts out at 125 watts electrical, falling to 100 after 14 years. Oh, good. That's good to know. Thank you, Steve Case. Tentative launch for your Kipper is 2024, so it's coming up pretty soon. I knew it was pretty soon, but I didn't know it was actually that soon. Boy, I tell you, 2024, the future has arrived. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's <laughs> a very, very exciting time to be alive, that's for sure. Oh, absolutely, uh, yeah. Yeah, what, what an incredible, uh, incredible missions we're going. I'm always... Uh, not to change the subject completely, but I'm really hoping that we go back to uh, the the outer planets, Neptune and Uranus. Um, that's uh, we've only sent one mission out there, and it'd be uh, you mentioned Triton really quick, but Triton yeah, may yeah. be the best candidate of them all. But we just yeah, it uh, could be yeah, yeah. But we just it's I don't know how long it'll take to get there, but um, yeah. but yeah. yeah um, yeah, uh, Keith, uh, we have uh, two more minutes here, but um, just a couple more minutes. But, um, oh, wait, we have uh, Z Shaw with a question. Yeah, about Titan, more interesting than uh, the moon uh, for life than a moon like Enceladus. Well, in, Enceladus was on that list. So um, I think we just, because of Cassini, you know, they do the decadal reviews. At, uh, at at NASA every 10 years, obviously. And they decided to go to Tat Titan. And for various reasons, they just thought it was more going to be more interesting than Enceladus. Um, I think that I don't know that there's more or less likely uh, for life on either one of those two. But because of Cassini, we do know now a lot about Titan. And, and uh, some of it I tried to convey tonight. So, yeah, a body with an atmosphere will always be more interesting. You know, that's a, that's a very good point. <laughs> well said, Steve. Thanks. Yeah, and um, I got 8.30 now, but... Um... Yeah, no, it's really exciting, you know, after this presentation, we're really thinking back and looking at our solar system, how exciting it is that we're looking for life in, uh, I hear, rumor, you know, rumors of, uh, I mean, they're seriously considered, you know, going back to Venus and looking for life of Venus, Mars, Jupiter's moons, Saturn's moons, who knows what's out there, and Triton. Um, we got a real, you know, we, we have yet to scratch the surface, Keith, right, as far oh, yeah. as our solar system goes. Yeah. And yeah, but look guess, what we're doing. I mean, yeah. what we're doing is amazing, you know, really amazing. And uh, Keith, yeah, uh, I guess uh, uh, last comments and on uh, uh, from from your end on, you know, what excites you about mo most about Titan and uh, well, what you'd like to leave us with, and then we'll close it out. Yeah. Oh, I would say where I really got excited was that book. Um, this book talks about today. So it's laid out each chapter in today and then future. So it takes every subject and it says, here's where we are today with what we know and what we can do. And then it goes to tomorrow, like that thing I said about walking around on the surface. So I think, um, you know, the potential for finding life there with all the stuff that's there. And then what could it mean to our path to a new home in the planets. And maybe it's not Titan, but we can sure learn a lot from Titan to extrapolate to other places, just like we are with Mars, right? And the moon. So that's what's gotten me excited again about Titan. <laughs> Well, um, if everyone, uh, I'm sure everyone at home, let's give uh, Keith a, a great round of applause. This was great. Thank you so much, uh, Keith. Keith Crumb, NASA Solar oh. System Ambassador, longtime SAS Thanks. member. 
Um, and uh, I've been catching Keith in person at the uh, optional uh, uh, meetings in person. So it's been good to see you. And um, yeah, once again, I'd really love to, uh, it'd be really great to connect either at Goldendale or Bonnie Lake, Covington, Paramount Park, Rattlesnake Ledge. Uh, there's a big community here and we're, um, we're, I'm itching to get out and um, uh, view the skies, view the planets. Um, and uh, and I'll hopefully we'll get to see some um, uh, Titan uh, later in the summer at night. So um, Keith, thanks so again so much. Uh, it's in, it's it's always inspiring um, to to hear about what's out there and what we're doing and uh, just the energy you bring is um, has been great. I, I'm uh, I was I was I was in the background with my my screen off a little bit uh, eating the pistachios and just kind of <laughs> hanging out. I was I was just hanging out and just enjoying the show. So yeah, um, thanks, Aaron. Yeah, yeah, we had a good well, crowd almost. Yeah, uh, Keith, go ahead. No, I just say I, I appreciate you, buddy. You yeah. do a great job here. So, All right. And well, uh, okay, thanks again, everyone. Fun. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's. Uh, yeah. Uh, we'll see you. We'll see you next month. Be uh, stay tuned. Um, check your emails and look out for the newsletter uh, in early July. And hopefully, we'll see you at a star party. Uh, and uh, we'll get this presentation up on our YouTube page as well. Uh, thank you, everyone. Really hope to see you all again soon. This is a great crowd tonight. Yeah, great. Yeah, great crowd. Yeah, have a good thanks night, everyone.